I do want to say a quick thanks to our one of our session sponsors, T-Stud. T-Stud is a simple concept, a thermally broken insulated wall stud assembly uh, for use in exterior walls and party walls. Uh, it's made right in Minnesota. Um, and so this is an insulated, uh, 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 structurally insulated uh, system, or SIFS as we call it. And it uh, can be used ideally on two by four construction uh, where you eliminate a lot of thermal bridging and reduce your stud need. And then you have a very well insulated stud that can cut um, energy use demand in a, in a residential or uh, commercial uh, low rise application. Um, we also want to say a big thanks to our second sponsor, Build Equinox. Uh, Build Equinox manufactures the CERV smart ventilation system right in central Illinois in its 100% solar powered facility. Um, and the serve is the first smart ventilation system for residents with active monitoring and control of indoor air quality, measuring carbon dioxide, and total volatile organic compounds. That's TVOCs or VOCs. With the CERV's IAQ sensors, filtered fresh air is delivered right to your client's home, right when they need it. Now, the CERV saves energy uh, with its efficient heat pump energy exchange technology. Uh, not only that, but it allows the CERV to actively heat or cool and dehumidify incoming fresh air. That makes the CERV ideal for any uh, climate, whether it's hot, humid, or cold. Check them out over at uh, buildequinox.com. All right, well, welcome to finally a zero energy primer and checklist to help you succeed. Uh, this course is approved for one hour in continuing education units, GVCI, AIBD, Mary Green, uh, Certified Green Professional, and Non-Whole House BPI. It is also approved for AIA HSW, um, which may make it applicable for your state-based design or contractor license. Uh, this course uh, is brought to you by uh, the Green Home Institute. Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the places we live. And today I'll be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the executive director here. Uh, it's not always easy to get to zero, but let's go over a potential roadmap uh, that you can use to help you uh, achieve net zero, uh, no matter what state you're in, um, and uh, help come up with some ideas to start putting uh, so your, your high-level plans together if you, if you don't know where to start. And I'm real excited to have uh, our speaker, um, Anne uh, Edminster back. Uh, she's spoken with us before. Um, real excited about that. She's a master's in architect, uh, international expert on sustainable residential construction and net zero energy, a principal developer of Lead for Homes, and she has authored Energy Free, Homes for a Small Planet, that award-winning uh, award guide to design and building zero energy homes. She consults on zero energy initiatives throughout North America and has served as a 2015 U.S. DOE Solar Decathlon Juror and is the Interim Executive Director of the Net Zero Energy Coalition. Uh, she collaborates with building professionals, utilities, nonprofits, supply chain clients, investors, public agencies, and homeowners to create a leading edge uh, projects that advocate for zero energy and low carbon building solutions at all scales. Uh, so with that, Anne, I will turn it over to you and thank you. Great. Um, good afternoon and good morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, I'm delighted to join Brett and the Green Home Institute and all of you today. So, and Brett invited me to do this talk because um, other than the book he mentioned, which I wrote nine years ago, hard to believe that, um, more recently I developed this zero net energy primer for the AIA's uh, California Council in response to the emerging zero energy codes in California to assist our local architects in addressing that code and the farther out goal of true zero net energy. So we won't actually be at zero net energy with our 2020 code, but we are quite a bit closer than uh, previous codes. So uh, there's a, quite a bit of information in this document that is California specific but there's also, I would say, the foundational information is pretty universal no matter where you are. This is a very principles-based document. It's short, it's visually oriented, and it's packed with resources. So what I will do today is really more a tour 
of the approach and the resources in the primer than it is the how to uh, zero net energy guide itself. So um, with that in mind, here we go. Um, let's see, do I click to, to advance, Brett? What am I doing here? Okay, wait, I see it. The arrows that um okay <laughs> okay so the four topics I'll work through today design principles and priorities followed by building systems um, a quick a guide to both the pitfalls you want to avoid and keys to success and then a little bit about where the zero energy building movement is headed which is pretty exciting actually so starting here with design principles and priorities. Of course, this is a complex topic, but in many ways it boils down to three simple things. A really good thermal enclosure, efficient heating, ventilating, air conditioning, and domestic hot water systems, and in most cases a solar roof or some other renewable energy system, but 90 plus percent of the time um, they will be solar roofs. And in addition to those three issues, I'd say there are these three companion issues, which are, it's not all about design, of course. Things have to get built and they have to work. So in the design process, it's very important to specify very carefully how you want the design executed, have it built with attention to detail, and then have performance verified in the field. So these are critical issues. Okay. Um, did we skip a slide? No. Okay. My clicker wasn't working all that responsively immediately. Sorry about that. So, and I also want to mention that these things, as I said, pretty basic, thermal enclosures, the mechanical systems, and the solar roof. And yet, there is more to each of these than appears on the surface. So for the most part in the building industry, what we see is thermal enclosures tend to be reduced by most people to, oh, it's all about our values, which is certainly part of it, but there's more. And similarly for the mechanical systems tends to be reduced to a question of equipment ratings. Again, quite a bit more to this. There's, I would say, um, getting to zero energy is really a question of not the silver bullet, but 100 silver BBs. And so each of these categories really comprises a couple of handfuls of silver BBs, and I'll talk a little bit more about each of them. And then finally, the solar roof seems, again, obvious. Sure, build a really good house, put solar on the roof or a carport or wherever. And yet there is also a bit more to that as well. You're seeing on the right this early design checklist. This is tiny type. It's not really intended for you to read right now. What I'm doing also with the resources box below is giving you some examples of materials that are in the primer. So that's all there for you to read. The link to the primer I had on my cover slide, but I think Brett redid the cover slide, so I'm not sure that link survived. We'll make sure that it gets to you all, so you have it. Let's not worry about it now. Anyway, so moving right along here to the next design principles, and this is probably the most important thing I have to say about the solar roof for the renewable energy component. Building geometry is hugely important. And most energy models, which many of us rely on to help us achieve high levels of energy efficiency, actually overlook building geometry. So in the models, we have a proposed design and a standard design. And the standard design is actually based on the building geometry of the proposed design. So you're getting no feedback about the building geometry or the impact of the building geometry on building performance. So this is really just a reminder that there are several drivers which indicate simplicity 
is our friend <laughs> in targeting any kind of high performance project, but most particularly one where um, energy is paramount and we hope to incorporate solar energy. So a simple form makes it much easier to both design, detail, and build a high performance thermal enclosure, also to provide enough space for the high performance systems, which in some cases require more space than their more conventional counterparts. And then if we have a relatively simple form, tends to have a relatively simple, straightforward roof, and it's going to be easier to accommodate enough solar energy to meet the zero energy goals. I'll have a little bit more to say about renewable energy at the end, but I'm going to keep moving, rolling here now, and get into the section on building systems. And again, want to point out here, this is a very, very quick tour of some of the systems and what's important about them and the resources that are available to help think about them and design and build them more effectively for zero energy within the primer, but I will not be going into all the nuts and bolts of exactly how to design those systems here. So um, bear in mind that I won't be able to cover the detail given the amount of time we have here, but there's a huge amount of information again, including the external resources packed into the Zero Energy Primer, which, by the way, is an electronic document, and all the resources in it are linked electronically, of course. As we all know, links can change, but for now, the vast majority of those links should work. Okay, starting off with wall and roof assemblies, and by the way, so I'm showing samples of resources. There are, these are really, again, a sampling um, for almost all of these sections, there are considerably more and sometimes volumes more resources within the primer. So I really encourage you all to download that. You can find it on the AIA California Council's website if you're anxious to get to it quickly. So in addition to the R values previously mentioned, um, there are a lot of opportunities for framing. Advanced framing or optimum value engineering, as it's been known for many years, has to this day still not garnered much of a following in the building industry, which is a continual source of frustration because it saves both materials and labor and improves thermal performance. So I'm a little puzzled as to why it's so poorly adopted. Nevertheless, uh, we're finding uh, on a series of zero energy projects in California that employing a holistic set of strategies that includes advanced framing um, can actually completely negate any of the premiums associated with some of the other upgrades necessary to achieve zero net energy. So it's a really high value strategy to approach. With cavity and exterior insulation, it's, as I mentioned, more than our value, there are quite a number of different types of insulation, and they all do have pros and cons. You'll see one of the resources that's listed here is the Building Degree Guide to Insulation. This, I believe, is behind a paywall. Very well worth getting this guide because it's really in-depth and goes into all the issues. Um, Building Green does an excellent job of staying up to date on the alternatives and what the issues are with all of them. And of course, there's also local availability and uh, the um, familiarity with trades and installation to deal with. In general, however, I'm not a huge fan of bats, I have to confess. They can be done well, but in the vast majority of cases, they are not done well. And it's, a, it's an uphill battle to get bats installed well. So I am a big fan of blown-in cavity insulation. And I was very intrigued to see the T-stud that Brett showed. Uh, that's the first one I've seen, and I'm curious about how our California structural engineers might view that here in seismic country. So I'm going to be following up on that after this webinar. Very, very interesting. In any case, what we're after is, again, eliminating thermal bridges. Barriers are hugely important, and in particular, maintaining the continuity 
of the air, vapor, and moisture barriers. This subject alone is worthy of and has many books dedicated to it, as well as a lot of other resources, again, some of which I have provided in our resource list. Uh, it's a complicated subject. It's very contextually driven by the particulars of climate and local building practice. So that is something that defies a universal prescription, nevertheless deserves a lot of attention. And then air leakage control, which is um, part and parcel of the air barrier, but air barrier is not the whole thing. Um, we're finding that in many of the projects we work on, I've, I've long held the view that um, those of you who are in colder climates have a much better handle on how to do air sealing than we do here in the West where we have milder climates. But I've actually been told by a number of my colleagues recently that that's not necessarily so. Um, so I will emphasize the issues that we find here are that air sealing is really not understood particularly as a trade and it's not very clear often whose job it is to either do the air sealing or oversee it and ensure performance through verification. So this is one I think is particularly important to address um, in both the design and, and construction processes. And I've, you'll see, got a whole further slide on that for that very reason. So what does that mean? Um, I, once again, this drawing on the right is not intended for you to be able to read it right now, but to be aware that this is a terrific resource. It's a, an air sealing cross-section with numerous details developed by Coldeman Hartman Architects in the Boston area. And they have very generously allowed this drawing to be available as a free download from their website. And of course, the idea isn't to copy it, but to use it more as a model to emulate in creating your own. Uh, certainly, having really good drawings doesn't ensure that the finished product is built as intended, but it goes a long way to towards that end. And as we all know, we call them contract documents for a reason. This is the way that we hold the building crew's feet to the fire of getting things done as, you know, according to the design intent. So if you're not already in the practice of incorporating details and an air sealing cross section, I would strongly counsel that you have a, a look at this resource and start to uh, incorporate similar features in your own drawing sets, those of you who are in the business of creating the drawings. As a companion, I think it's also important to include the air sealing information in the specs, as well as including in specs how you want insulation installed and any other critical quality tasks. One of the resources not included in this presentation, but included in the primer, is um, a document from the National Association of Home Builders with high performance scopes of work. And that's also a really excellent resource for incorporating the quality management information that is critical into the specs, again, or scopes of work. Um, and then as a separate item I've here, I've got communicating the intent. So uh, as obvious as it seems, it took being a parent for me to finally understand this issue. Uh, this is because I have a singularly headstrong child who really pretty much wouldn't do anything without having a clear understanding of why it was that he was expected to do it. We're still dealing with this now. He's learning to drive and it's, he wants his hands to be at the bottom of the steering wheel and I had to think really hard about well, why exactly is it we put our hands at the top, <laughs> at the 10 and two position or nine and three at, at most and not down at eight and four. So when he was two, it was a little challenging to explain why he shouldn't run out in the middle of a moving vehicle because I didn't have time for that explanation. But all these experiences finally made the light bulb go off in my head one day as I was teaching a class that if I can't 
have a child do something without understanding why, there's absolutely no possibility that a full-grown adult is going to do anything without understanding why in preference to the way he or she is doing it already or has been habitually doing it. So I think this is a really, really crucial point, and that is we need to not only say what we want done, but what it is we're trying to accomplish and really share the goals of the project with the entire design and construction team in order to really support achievement of those goals. And the final point here, managing quality during construction. So in general, on a high performance project, zero energy, lead platinum, living building, whatever flavor of beyond normal it is that we're trying to achieve on a specific job, um, what we're doing is we're asking everyone who's participating to step outside their normal practice. And that means it's very easy for people to fall into habitual patterns and not intentionally sabotage or fall short in terms of the execution, but it can happen. And so really managing the quality during construction is a very critical task. Okay, enough about that. Moving on to more of the building systems fenestration. So windows, um, one of the most important issues here is avoiding overheating. And that may sound strange when uh, you guys have very profound winters and say, yeah, we, we love getting summer in the winter. And of course we do. But what we're finding is in zero energy projects all over North America, it is actually possible to overheat due to insufficient attention to glazing design. And this is because our homes are becoming more and more like really good styrofoam coolers where you can put a block of ice in and leave it all day. And if you don't open it, it'll still be frozen the next day. Similarly, a really well-insulated thermal enclosure means that um, if we get heat in, UV has this funny way of coming in through the glass, it's going to be really hard to lose that heat. And if we get too much of it, we can create severe comfort problems. So dealing with windows is really rising to the top as a critical issue. So the advice is, of course, holding the glass area in check. One of my favorite quips to my modernist clients is, I don't really think your knees appreciate the view. We don't really need glass down near the floor. I know it's very popular in contemporary design, but it's, uh, it's not a favorite feature of mine. And of course, uh, specifying appropriate U-values and solar heat gain coefficients for the climate. And that means, in most cases, abandoning the notion of passive solar gain and going with um, the higher SHGC values. Generally speaking, we're aiming for lower SHGC values. And of course, shading and glare protection, important both for thermal comfort and visual comfort. And then skylights should be used, in my view, um, very carefully, that it's really difficult to prevent skylights from um, admitting too much solar gain when we don't want it, and also um, having night sky radiation create a thermal liability for us at night and in winter. Okay, next system, heating and cooling. Uh, this is a very big topic and deserves days and days and days of attention, but we've boiled a few key points down here. So again, beyond equipment efficiency, which you'll see is the third bullet, location, and again, I may be preaching completely to the choir here, but the equipment and ducts all really belong in conditioned space, and that means planning for it from the beginning. I, I know there are many, many homes designed here in the West where I work where it's assumed that the HVAC sub will figure out where to run the ducts and 
where to put the equipment somewhere. And that's asking for problems. So it's really important that designing those spaces and where those runs go um, be part of the design job and be communicated successfully in the document. <coughs> um, sizing is also critical. When we've reduced our enclosure loads, um, all the rules of thumb that uh, folks have been working with in the trades for decades go out the window and are no longer relevant. So we really need to insist on use of the ACA manuals for sizing and that we insist on seeing the load calculations verifying that the equipment is sized based on those calcs and getting complete specs for all elements within the system. And then um, again, efficiency is important of the equipment items. Distribution system design also important. There's still, I think, very prevalent practice of running ducts, for example, all the way to exterior walls. When we've done a really great job on the enclosure, that's no longer necessary. So we can get the ducts much shorter. We want the shortest runs, the fewest bends, the cleanest installation possible. So this, again, really should go into the original thinking about the form of the building and not be an afterthought. And I've already talked quite a bit about the importance of insulation quality and commissioning. Um, there's been quite a bit of research here funded by the California Energy Commission defines that installation quality has a much, much larger impact on overall system performance and efficiency, um, again, both from an, uh, a comfort perspective as well as just a purely energy performance perspective uh, than has been previously thought. So really important to see that systems are installed correctly. On um, one project that I worked on a couple of years ago, everything uh, seemed to be going beautifully, everything was inspected in the field, final, final uh, duct blaster test showed really degraded performance from an, what an earlier test had shown, and it was determined that the painter had taken off all the grills and detached the duct boots from the grills for the painting. So really important to check performance and do that final commissioning on every project. And then finally, I believe that the one of the most critical aspects of getting a good HVAC system installed is working with a sub who has prior experience with high performance low load systems. Because again, there's a very, very strong tendency to um, revert to default approaches here. There's, um, again, resources listed here and a little table of quality heating and cooling specification guidelines. I've made one particular note here to note that cooling airflow in the z &E primer for the AIA California Council has only the higher rate, the 550 CFM per ton value, which is good west of the Rockies where humidification conditions are very different in your part of the world, that value should be 400 CFM per ton. The rest of these values are pretty solid throughout North America, believe it or not. Uh, so these are our challenging numbers and probably are raising some eyebrows, but that's what our research shows. Hey, Ann, um, yeah. uh -huh. real quick, do you, um, have any uh, guidance um, or recommendations on the uh, um, HVAC sizing software? Um, so the specific question here is asking if the passive house planning package is okay. I also know that a lot of people really highly recommend ACA version 8, I want to say now, is the way to go. Uh, so any thoughts there? Uh, you know, this is, I am not a mechanical engineer, so this is a little above my pay grade. Um, but I, the, the engineers that I work with do believe that the ACA manuals, I, I can't speak to version, but they do put quite a bit of faith by them. However, um, one of the things that they've pointed out is that 
the manuals aren't necessarily always employed properly in that the input values can often be mistaken and based on, um, let's say, non-high performance assumptions. In terms of the planning house, uh, sorry, PHPP, the passive house planning package, I have not heard feedback about that as a sizing guide. So that one I really can't comment on at all. Thank you. But I, I suspect it provides good values um, for the enclosure. It, it should. Okay. All right, um, moving on to water heating. Once again, you'll see equipment efficiency is down here as the third bullet point, uh, so not paramount, but not unimportant either. Once again, location. We're really looking to get water heaters in condition space. And the distribution, quite a bit of efficiency can be gained by doing a very compact centralized distribution system. One of our uh, more, what, what am I going to say, obsessive, um, creative, committed, builders here in Northern California has managed to get all of his hot water systems so that the longest run of hot water pipe is 12 feet. That's pretty phenomenal. It's not a huge house. I think that's about a 1,200 square foot single story house. Nevertheless, it's a, a great illustration of what can be done when one is thinking creatively about the systems layout in designing the home. And the little diagram above uh, the comment there, when you can't provide a compact layout, a recirculating hot water loop is a great alternative, provided, of course, that it's an on-demand recirculating loop and not a constantly running one. So we've got a little bit more information, uh, resources on that approach. Drain water heat recovery can be can work well within a compact system and particularly a multi-story homes. Um, solar water heating, there's a, a wonderful set of blogs in Green Building Advisor um, by um, Martin on uh, titled um, "Solar Hot Water Is Dead." And so that's a, a worthwhile set of reads. Most of the folks that I know are really leaning towards electric approaches. And even where they're not, they're saying that really solar thermal is kind of losing in comparison to heat pump water heaters in combination with PV in terms of providing um, equal or better efficiency performance, as well as being cost competitive and eliminating an additional system. So if solar thermal is something that you're interested in, I really encourage reading more about that. And then finally, of course, for water heating, we also want super efficient um, appliances and fixtures. I, I wanted to say too on the on the solar water heating, um, you know, a lot of the solar installers we see actually are uh, are don't installed anymore. And in fact, they're taking it down and replacing it with PV. And I know one of the running jokes is, is if you overproduce solar hot water, you've got a problem. If you overproduce solar PV, you, you've given uh, renewable electricity to the grid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's, um, we still have some challenges in terms of overproduction of solar electricity in that most of us don't particularly wish to be philanthropists to our local utilities. Um, and of course, in, there are some other challenges there's a lot of conversation here in the West about the duck curve of um, overproduction of solar in the afternoon, and that's a whole other topic we could have a, another fun webinar about. But and, and, and again, I will say a little bit more about solar at the end. But yeah, I think that there does seem to be a prevailing trend away from solar thermal in favor of PV and uh, electric water heating. Thanks for adding that comment, Brett. Um, electric loads. So this is in many ways one of our, our simpler topics. Lighting, ideally we're going towards 100% LED and I have to say that the, the lighting industry for many, many 
years, even decades within my career, has been a source of frustration in being very laggardly in producing better designs. And I feel like that has finally turned around in a very big way. I'm so happy about this. It is now possible to find many, many, many types of LEDs. They're getting much better on color rendering and um, color temperature as well, different fixture styles. So many replacements for, for example, old can lights can now be replaced with more flush fixtures that really mimic the appearance of cans. Hooray, hooray. Such a, a wonderful um, area to see progress in. And then appliances and electronics. For years, of course, Energy Star has been the standard, and most people, I think, are, are fairly accustomed to going towards Energy Star. Uh, so I think it's worth noting that Energy Star is really no longer, in my view, going far enough, or certainly is not as far as one can go. In fact, EPA has introduced a new category within Energy Star called Most Efficient. Um, I, that's one place to look on their websites, and then I've given two more really terrific resources for finding best-in-class um, plug devices over on the right. And then monitoring, there is, I, I would say the jury is really out as to how effective monitoring or awareness devices are in driving in uh, changes in occupant behaviors in terms of their energy use. However, I have a real belief and philosophy that because we are still in the early adopter days with zero energy homes, many of those home occupants are going to be more than routinely interested in how they're doing in meeting their zero energy goals. So I believe it's, it's a real opportunity that we have at this stage in developing zero energy projects to start to cultivate um, more energy literacy among occupants by including these devices. And they can range from the fairly sophisticated example shown at the bottom left here of uh, systems that can be displayed on your home computer that are web enabled, that have phone apps and so forth, to the much simpler, there's a little device shown next to that called the Canary which is simply lives in a plug outlet, maybe by your kitchen counter, and uses color signals to let you know how you're doing with regard to your energy budget. So it glows green, obviously, that's the go, you're doing great, shades through yellow and into magenta um, as you're using more energy above average. So there's a whole range of possibilities there, and I encourage incorporating something along that spectrum. By the way, Canary, I think, is a really creative company, and they're working on a next-generation device called Nexi, any XI that I think is going to be very interesting when it comes out, too. So keep your eye on, on that field. Okay, so that was a Zoom, the Express, the Concord uh, tour of building systems. Now I'm just going to run quickly through the pitfalls. And again, this is based on working pretty much exclusively in the field of zero net energy for uh, close to a decade now. So pitfalls to avoid and then keys to success, which go hand in glove, not surprisingly. So the three biggest issues that my colleagues and I have encountered relate, first of all, to design. That um, particularly with production builders who are accustomed to developing a catalog of designs and um, kind of refreshing and reworking those on subsequent projects. There is a lot of attachment to that and understandably because there is a lot of investment in production building designs. On the other hand, um, further investment in those designs to um, develop them or even start from scratch for zero energy, I think it's extremely worthwhile because those investments are amortized over the course of all further projects. So that, that is really the, the optimum opportunity to do that. But failure to, or, or reluctance to, 
step away from established design can really get in the way of achieving zero net energy, which honestly isn't that hard when it's approached with a fresh mind. The problem with being too wedded to existing designs is that the, the changes to achieve zero net energy typically become additive. Well, we will upgrade the fear value on the, the AC, for example. Well, that costs more. You're adding more. Sure, you will get a little bit of in, uh, efficiency improvement from that, but we'll add more insulation. That's a good one to add. Nevertheless, that's still an additive cost rethinking from the beginning, and again, I love the TSTA, that's a really uh, a wonderful innovation, and it's exactly the type of thinking that I think really drives success with zero energy, is to say, ah, we could do something different. That one, of course, doesn't even require a difference in design, it's just a difference in the way of thinking about the design. So I want to encourage that beginner's mind, in essence, to say, okay, if we want to achieve zero energy, maybe we start over. And I have a, a really wonderful anecdote about that. Jean Myers is the CEO of Thrive Home Builders in the Denver metro area. And Jean has been in the business of high performance for several decades now. He's really been at the forefront of adoption of each new wave of um, efficiency as it's come along, working with um, EPA on the Energy Star program, the Department of Energy and Building America, um, now Department of Energy's Zero Energy Ready Homes Program, and he's always, always innovating and figuring out how to do it. So this is a guy who really understands how to run a business successfully while innovating. And Gene tells his story very candidly that when he first approached Zero Net Energy, it was additive, and he, in fact, offered it as an option to home buyers. And first of all, found that it didn't really sell. People didn't go for the option. But he was committed to this idea, and he said, you know, we just went back to the drawing board and designed our zero energy homes from the ground up, from scratch. And funny thing, we basically realized we could design our zero energy homes at the same price point as our prior non-zero energy homes when we did start from scratch. So I think this is a, a great lesson for everyone. And of course, Gene has, he's got climate. <laughs> Colorado gets very, very cold. So it's not as though he's in our, uh, you know, what some people view as the easy climate here in California. We have 16 climate zones, by the way including one that resembles Chicago more than anything else. So just just want to let you all know we don't all live in Santa Monica or San Diego where it's temperate all year round. <laughs> okay, the second uh, pitfall that we have seen most commonly is gaps in the construction documents. So, and this happens surprisingly frequently. Um, again, I've worked with a lot of teams that have been very excited and, and adopted some very perform, uh, ambitious performance goals, zero energy right up there, and agreed on various measures to um, meet the zero energy goals, and then had problems during construction, and we hear about the problems and troubleshoot and say, well, what happened? Really a startling number of cases where these problems have arisen it's because whatever the agreed upon measures were either didn't make it into the construction documents or weren't incorporated in a successful way. And one example that I looked into in one of these problem cases that really caused me to scratch my head was um, a case where there was a, a checklist that had been developed in working with the project team of know, what were the changes, this was a production builder, what were the changes they were going to make from their prior standard practice? So there was, a, of course, a back and forth, a lot of dialogue with many members of the design team, the mechanical engineer and the structural engineer and so forth. And 
So the final list appeared in the construction documents. However, it was literally picked up off of a PDF and dumped onto either the, the title page or the second page of the drawing set. None of the individual items were actually baked into the specific drawings and details in the rest of the drawing set. So <laughs> when I saw that, I thought, wow, okay, note to self. This is something that really needs to be emphasized that the, the changes have to make their way all the way through to the most uh, granular level of detail within the construction documents. Okay, and then finally the third one, which is quite related to the first and the second, but bears emphasizing and looking at from another angle. Defaulting to standard practices. We are all creatures of habit. Um, people who've been doing whatever their work is for however many years or decades or an entire career have a way of doing things. And once again, as I mentioned earlier, when we're looking at achieving a different goal, a higher goal, we're by definition trying to create change, change in individual practice as well as in institutions. And so we have to be very vigilant about combating the habitual responses and um, having systems in place to check throughout the design and construction process that habit isn't getting in the way of the goals we actually want to achieve. So uh, no real concrete solutions there other than have systems. Actually, I will offer one solution I think is really critical, doesn't necessarily require any particular expense or anything radical. It's identifying a champion for the goals within the project team, and that might be the architect, might be the owner, might be the general contractor, might be the energy consultant. Um, whomever it is, giving that person the overview and the authority to keep tabs on where the project is going from the very beginning of the design to completion of the project in the field can be a tremendously effective measure in keeping things on track. Okay, keys to success. So. Obviously, the last conversation had as much to do with keys to success as it did with the pitfalls. So I'm not going to walk all the way through this. Uh, I think you guys have probably heard most of these points from me throughout the presentation. Um, I'll draw on just a, a couple of ones that I have not already addressed. Starting with a goal that is communicated to everyone and is, has commitments from the very seat of authority of the project, whether that's the homeowner, if it's a developer, um, project manager, everybody has to be on board with the goal or it's going to be very hard to see it through to the end. Learn from the pioneers. Um, there are a number of resources listed. Uh, the two in the middle over here in the blue box, there is a case study database that was originally created by NESI, the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, has also been uh, contributed to by the Net Zero Energy Coalition, has a, a lot of examples of built zero energy projects. And I think those are very instructive. You can look at them and look for similar climates, similar architectural styles, similar style of, uh, or sizes of projects, single family, multifamily, and learn quite a bit by seeing how others who have gone before have created zero energy projects. And similarly, the Department of Energy's Tour of Zero also has project profiles. They're not as in-depth, but there are a lot of them. So those are both excellent resources. Your team matters tremendously. Um, and I, I like these four characteristics, commitment, creativity, experience, and engagement. 
these are the secret to a success, in my view. Um, a lack of commitment is really kind of a death knell for high performance goals. Creativity, equally important, um, because otherwise it's hard to dislodge all of us from our particular professional ruts. Experience with high performance zero energy projects may be hard to come by. What I generally counsel is that you will probably not find deep experience for every member of your project team, but if there's a good body of experience across the team as a whole, that's very helpful. And then the, the commitment to goals and creativity, of course, in combination with an experienced team really is very important. And finally, this engagement I added after having a big aha moment in a project that was really challenged, particularly in dealing with the mechanical system design. And eventually, a number of us who were involved in the project realized that the mechanical engineering consultant we were working with while they had excellent green and energy efficiency credentials, really weren't working well with the rest of the team. They were attending meetings and they seemed collaborative, but then they would go away and kind of do their own thing in a way that really was not in concert with the rest of the team and come back and weren't achieving the performance that the uh, project was striving for either. So finally, they had to be replaced, and then things really fell into place. So I finally realized that, you know, goals are important, commitment, all that is important. Credentials, important, yes, but that's not the end of it. This is, so I, engagement for me is shorthand for plays well with others. Okay, we've talked about uh, the enclosure, field performance, of course. And then um, finally at the bottom in some ways is what my subhead above says, start with the end in mind. When you begin design, it's really helpful to make a checklist of the new things. You know, what's going to be different? And I think it will be very easy to create this list for yourself after going through the primer and saying, okay, this is something we already do well. Here's something we may want to look at or possibly do differently. And have that checklist handy. It's probably a short checklist as you work through the design and construction. And I believe we are almost there. Now we're going to talk about some the builder insights, which are part of the, the lessons learned and keys to success. So these are from some of my, my heroes within this industry, some quotes. I mentioned George to you guys earlier. Uh, he's the builder who is the um, amazing creative and, and borderline obsessive individual who has figured out so many advanced framing innovations that have offset many, many other expenses. For example, increasing the insulation, adding exterior insulation, which they did not previously use, and so forth. And as you know, he's, he works for Habitat for Humanity. Um, you can't really find a more cost-conscious organization than Habitat. And um, I've worked with a number of Habitat affiliates in the past, and there's always a tension of, well, we can invest in green building measures, or we can save that money and build one more home. And I love the fact that George has straddled this line and said, this isn't an either or, this is a both and. And he's done that through his knowledge, which spans being a general contractor, working in a panel factory, and working in modular construction. And the man lives, eats, and breathes efficiency. Um, Josh Salinger, who is a custom builder in Portland, Oregon, um, also, they, the, everyone who's been pioneering this field really has something important to share and that's particular to their markets and to where they work in the market. In Josh's case, he's saying, you know, we are really looking at what differentiates us and that at, that is that we're offering comfort, performance, and quality, and by the way, at 
very close to cost parity with our competitors who really don't offer that differentiation. Anthony Abbey, who's in um, upstate New York, is really a maverick in his market. And he says, you know, our buyers, they don't really care about energy. They don't really care about climate change. What they care about is cost and practicality. And so even though we achieve all those other things, we talk to them about how they're saving energy and helping combat climate change. But what they're most interested in is that we're giving them stable, low utility bills. And so that's what we sh share with them. Um, so they're, they're important messages. And then similarly, I've already mentioned Gene Myers, who's this other hero of mine who has many, many valuable nuggets to share. And uh, again, really exemplifies what all these builders have to say. They've all arrived at the decision to build zero energy homes for their own reasons, for their own priorities, um, most of which have to do with quality of life for their buyers and their own environmental commitment. Um, so combination of sustainability factors, really it is the three-legged stool of social equity, the economy, and the environment. And, and Jean is really pointing out that different buyers have different priorities Health is a big one for almost everybody. So they've tried very elaborate sales schemes. They've been very technical. And he said, you know, what really works in our market is to get down to the basics of health and the prosperity of a family and really speaking to that health message. Okay, so finally, a few notes about where we're heading. And I notice we're a minute over the hour. So we'll be very fast here. We still have a very, very tiny market share in the zero energy world, but it is growing dramatically. We're very excited to see this research, uh, which we performed three years running now for the Net Zero Energy Coalition. So we are in double digits and um, exponential growth. There's also other research showing that there is going to be more and more growth in this field. It's a great market opportunity for those who jump into it early in particular. Another thing that I think uh, perhaps is surprising to many is that most zero energy projects are not one-off custom projects. The vast majority of them are business undertakings. They are profitable. And there's also a significant fraction. You'll see the 60% uh, multifamily. Most of those multifamily projects are affordable housing. So there is no economic barrier whatsoever. And then one of my favorite messages is another one of our production builders here in California. They are moving towards all electric. They're not there, but they're finding that as their buyers become more and more educated about the issues with fossil fuels, including personal safety in the home. They are migrating to all electric. So we're very much seeing that um, fossil fuels are going the way of the dinosaurs. And um, whereas 10 years ago, I would say there was much more of a mixed view on whether it made sense to go all electric or stay with a mix of fuels in the home, now there's a really very powerful drive towards all electric homes. And um, I was going to offer just a few final words. You'll notice I haven't said much about solar. That is because when you design a really, really high efficiency, high performance home, how you achieve the renewable energy component can, um, that there are a lot of options there. Com community choice aggregation, which is sweeping California will soon be coming to an area near you. Uh, I don't have time to really say much about that. Also, individual states' renewable portfolio standards are driving uh, the states more and more towards cleaner energy on the grid. We just passed a, a bill here in California that says we will have 100% clean electricity by 2045, which is tremendously exciting. Community solar is also coming on board. I know it's uh, making some inroads in Minnesota, as well as a couple of other states. So rooftop solar or on-site wind 
is certainly an option, but by no means the only approach to achieving zero energy. And that is a wrap, except for whatever questions Brett may have waiting for me in the wings. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dan. Well, um, we're going to get to questions. I see some of them coming in. Please put your questions in. We've got about uh, 10 minutes here. Um, but a big thanks to uh, all of our uh, members, our board of directors, our volunteers, and our top uh, tier sponsors, uh, T-Stud, uh, Insulated Wall Stud Assemblies, Shrinergies for, uh, for uh, batteries on the go while you're camping, or backup emergency or microgrid solutions. And then Mitsubishi Electric, helping you take your HVAC systems all electric to hit net zero energy. Um, so, and I actually was, uh, here, a question came in and it was definitely on my mind, um, but can you talk to us a little bit about um, the role uh, that you see of energy modeling um, being played in uh, getting to net zero? Yeah, I will. Um, actually, a favorite topic of mine. I'm a great believer in energy modeling, and which, which sometimes put me at odds with some of my colleagues who say, ah, energy modeling, it's never accurate, and, you know, to which my response is, accuracy is great, and I know passive house advocates, uh, of which I'm sure there are quite a few in your audience, are really um, very enamored of the accuracy of the passive house planning package, which is terrific. Um, and useful certainly in sizing an on-site renewable energy system. To me, the principal value for all projects of energy modeling is not that it's going to provide an extremely accurate prediction of an individual household's energy use, but that it provides information about the relative performance of various energy options. So rather than being a tailpipe exercise, I like to see energy modeling used early and frequently throughout the design process to evaluate changes to design and uh, relative effectiveness of different measures. So does that help or do you have other specific questions in mind? I mean, I know I know you all have um, Title 24, um, but which I believe for the rest of us is just the HERS rating. Uh, is that kind of what you recommend for the for the tool? You know, when I was originally writing Energy Free back in 2009, one of the things I really wanted to do in an appendix was offer a comparison of various different energy models and how, how good they were, how effective they were at um, providing the information we all wanted. What I discovered at that time was there are very, very few people who are conversant in more than, say, two packages. So I couldn't really get authoritative information on that, which is quite frustrating and remains the case as far as I can tell. I did find someone at NREL who seemed to know most of them pretty well, but because of um, their position there, we're not able to really be candid about it, which is also disappointing. Uh, so I think that um, in, in the cold or the extreme climates, uh, I have not myself used the PHPP, but I imagine that it's probably by far and away the favored option there. Um, in California, we do tend to use a CBEC res, um, not relevant for those of you outside California. One of uh, my eternal challenges here is the use of our time-dependent valuation metric, which means zero, quote, zero energy, you see my air quotes, um, is not comparable to anywhere else. So uh, we're making some progress with that. But long story short, I think you each each person in, in a given region has to determine what the best tools are in your area by talking to your colleagues and comparing notes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. And, answer. And, and I will say, you know, for what it's worth, the the very handful of net zero REM rate hers rated projects we've seen a year later, we've tracked it and normalized for weather and only found that they were off by a couple hundred kilowatt hours prediction. Um, and so the, for the perfectionists out there, you know, I know that's unfortunate, but for the rest of us, um, we were excited for how close we were. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> um, that is, that is encouraging. Yeah. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on, 
uh, like uh, structurally, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, SIPs or uh, ICS or even uh, kind of heading into prefab and, and modular now in regards to getting to zero? Does it help? Is it necessary? Sure. Um, but before I do that, I actually want to backtrack and say one more thing about the energy modeling and because, you know, afterthought. And that is that there's um, there have been a number of, of projects, both formal research and informal research, that have looked at things like variability of energy use among different households. And there is huge variability among households that are otherwise relatively similar in configuration, the home construction itself and so forth. And I think the thing to keep in mind is that you know, really where we need to be headed is to zero net energy as a culture as opposed to on an individual household basis. And so what happens though when those large groups of um, households are looked at in aggregate, they do tend to normalize at pretty close to whatever the energy model is showing that they would do. So while an individual household might be off dramatically, this is sort of like the crowdsourcing of, of answers to things, right? That this is sort of crowdsourced energy usage does tend to track. So again, I, I view the variability at an individual household level as not terribly important when we're getting the numbers that we're looking for in aggregate. Okay, so um, SIPs, ICFs, uh, other systems like that. Um, you know, I think that all of those systems have their potential. I, I've long been a fan of SIPs because they save lumber as well as being quite energy efficient. Oftentimes, you know, we're always looking at sort of apples, oranges, step ladders, and wing nuts, uh, you know, in comparing different systems because they have different environmental attributes. So. Um, pros and cons of those systems includes looking at their constituent materials. Uh, one of the sort of forgotten stepchildren in the whole field of zero energy, which I didn't touch on at all today, is embodied energy or embodied carbon. And so I, I believe that's increasingly important. You know, we have, if we're lucky, a 20-year window to turn around the climate change engine. And what we find um, embodied carbon has been really relegated to the sidelines as much subordinate to operating energy because it represents a relatively small fraction of the overall energy associated with the build building in terms of the building's lifespan. However, when we narrow that window and look at the 15 or 20 year horizon, the embodied carbon of new construction dwarfs the operating energy over those 15 to 20 years. And so I think we need to be looking at those systems with a critical eye to the embodied carbon in those systems. That's that's absolute paramount well, to me. In well, existing that, construction, if we're retrofitting, most embodied carbon is in the foundation and structure. Um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of where I go with that question is looking at those. And that's where I again would refer back to um, for example, Building Green's Guide to Insulation to re really take a critical look at what is the insulation component of those systems. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings up a great point. Um, somebody asked a question about the feasibility of renovations and getting those to net zero. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts there? Well, it's a very different financial equation and, and really challenging, particularly um, for those who are um, leaning towards going all electric, and I'm certainly grappling with this in my house, which is a mixed fuel house, and thinking, how do I do this economically? And one of the conclusions I have come to is I can't afford to just scrap all the old natural gas stuff and bring in fresh all electric appliances and service, get the service where I need it um, all at once. But there's a, a more opportunistic way to look at this, which is first of all, and fairly obviously, when um, various devices are aging out to research 
proactively, uh, what is the lifespan of this device? We had this happen with a dishwasher recently, which wasn't a fuel switch question, but um, the dishwasher went south, and my husband said, well, I'm going to call the repair guy. And I said, oh, well, hang on just a minute. Let me do a little research. And I researched the average lifespan of a dishwasher and figured out by going back through my accounting records when we had bought the dishwasher, which was, I believe, eight years prior, and the average lifespan of a dishwasher was nine years. And I said, no, we're buying a new dishwasher <laughs> because the last appliance repair we had had cost half the price of a new dishwasher. So that made no sense at all. So I think understanding that all of these devices, you know, water heaters, clothes dryers, um, mechanical systems, heating and cooling equipment, they do have a relatively predictable lifespan and getting on top of that so we know what our replacement strategy is going to be when the time comes and ideally proactively making that replacement before there's a failure. So, you know, we all know the stories of water heaters that die right before all your relatives arrive for a big holiday dinner. So. Like, don't let your water heater die and have to get whatever the guy has on the truck. Like, figure out that replacement strategy ahead of time and get it purchased and installed. And if you lose one year on the lifespan of that equipment, it's really not that big a deal as compared to the inconvenience of the crisis replacement, the additional cost attached to that, and the lost opportunity of getting what you really want installed. So I think that's really um, one of the basics. Another thing to think about is looking at the whole system holistically. So it, in my house, which I think is probably not atypical, we've got a two-story house, it's split level. We have a photovoltaics on the lower story. The upper story is kind of available. It wasn't at the time we put the PVs in because we had two tall pine trees, which has since died and been removed. So we have potential for quite a bit more solar. Um, we've also got a couple of elderly vehicles. I'd love to get an EV. The upper story roof is due for replacement, and the construction up there is, let's say, fairly suboptimal from many perspectives, you know, in terms of thermal performance and, and general building science because it's an older part of the structure. So I'm kind of trying to figure out, okay, if I can redo the roof, add solar, switch to electric appliances, at least a couple of them, and get an EV all at the same time and wrap all of it into a single loan, then the net monthly effect shouldn't be too painful and much smarter than trying to do each one of those things individually. Now, I haven't got all the details worked out. When I do, it'll make a great blog. But I, I think that's the way to think about these things. Well, and I, I appreciate you sharing your story. And uh, I'll definitely love to see that blog and share it because I'm, uh, I'm trying to do the exact same thing and, and think <laughs> through all these, too, um, you know, on, on my small amount of free time. <laughs> but, uh, um, well, I know, I know you have to get going. Maybe you have another second. Um, I know right now zero energy – is sort of this loosely defined term. It's like you said, early adopter stage. We like to call it sort of the wild west stage where at the end of the day, anybody can claim something as zero energy um, and there's not really much to um, prevent them from doing so. So the question I like to ask folks who work in this field is, you know, what does zero energy uh, mean to you when, when you say it? Ah, great question. I live in the world of a, a soup of definitions. I'm, well, okay, so I think there are, there are two definitions that I like fairly well. One is the Department of Energy's, quote, common definition of ZE, which is based on a source energy metric. Um, however, it is a national, it's based on national site-to-source multipliers, which fundamentally I don't really have a problem with, because even though those multipliers do vary from region to region, in reality, we are operating on a national grid. All the grids are interconnected. So I think that's a, a very fair and legitimate definition to use. I also like net zero site energy because it's simple. 
um, I can fairly easily track and calculate how much energy I'm using on site and how much energy I'm producing on site. So I'm, I like that. Really though, where I think we need to be headed, as I mentioned earlier, is towards zero net energy at community scale, um, which has a lot more flexibility to it, ultimately will create, it will be much more economical because we'll be able to create community solar arrays and community microgrids where we have shared resources that are um, offer economies of scale that are not available on individual properties. So that's the direction I think we need to be going. Um, community resources ideally will also balance out production with battery storage so that we start to move away from some of the grid constraints that are worrying um, folks who deal with utilities and, and grids right now. So that's where I really think we need to be headed is community scale. Um, we'll call that a site or landscape net zero and ideally carbon as opposed to energy because we do need to be phasing out fossil fuels. We are, you know, killing ourselves with combustion of natural, you know, gas and propane. So we need to, we need to stop that. So that's where I'm headed. All right. Well, um, Anne and Minister, I really thank you for your time and joining us today. And right before we wrap up, where can people find out uh, more information uh, about you or this checklist or contact you if they have further questions? Sure. Thank you for asking. Um, my URL is up on the screen right now, anneedminster.com, and my email is ann at anneedminster.com. And I thank you all so much for your attention today. I'd be more than happy to answer individual questions um, or point you to some of these resources. And Brett, will you be able to send out the link to the um, AIA primer to all the folks who registered for the webinar? Yeah, we'll get that sent out and we'll have that listed online too. So thank awesome. you. Thanks so much. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of your week. Take care.